Welcome to our continuing education seminar series with Norris Medical, talking about some pertinent information that uh, I think is really important to all of our practices, regardless of what the profile of your practice is, regardless of what your treatment planning systems are. You know, the, the all on X procedure, the all on four, five, six, eight, whatever it is you're doing, is, is really changing and has changed a tremendous amount for me specifically over the last three to four years, just because of what I've seen from a failure standpoint with these procedures. And I think you have to really start to understand, you know, where you're going when you start the treatment planning process, especially in the maxillary arch, because the maxillary arch is a total different animal than the mandibular arches. And with the popularity of all of these, these all on X procedures, you know, we really have to start to redirect and think about you know, what it is we're doing from a treatment planning standpoint when we start to set these cases up. So I, this is part one of two parts that I'll be doing for Norris Education. And uh, today we're going to start out a little bit in the beginning with, you know, what, what, what's happening in my practice, the changes that I've seen, how we've incorporated these changes that I've seen into our treatment planning phase and what it is that we're doing as far as, you know, looking at patients when they come in now for all and next procedures and, and what we're starting to notice from the beginning. And, I, and we've got you know, several videos. We've got some videos of me just going over x-rays and talking, which I'm going to let play at that point in time. We've got a couple of surgical videos that I'm going to incorporate showing you different things. Now, I will apologize to all of you up front. Some of the final edits are not done with the video, so it might be a little choppy in certain areas, but I'm going to move it through there. But I, I can tell you that you're going to see some things that I think I'm hoping will help you reevaluate, possibly reevaluate, some of the, the, the things that you're thinking about when you get into an all next procedure. I've got my little my little skeleton cup here that my wife gave me. We're gonna have a coffee or a fireside chat with the Don. How's that sound? Okay. So let's let's get going on our, on our presentation. Okay. So one of the things that we or a few things that we've seen in our multi specialty practice is really trends that have been happening, and for me, it's been happening over the last several years. Uh, just where my practice as a as, as trained as a periodontist, certified in periodontics. But now more of an oral surgeon and what we're doing, it's just a trend of what's happened in my practice away from the periodontal realm, but still building in all the periodontal things that I was trained on and I've used for years and years, but bringing it in now to a more. So one of the things that we're all seeing in, in our practices are failures, okay? In revision cases, if you get an old, old enough like me, okay? And for those of you who don't know that, I'm almost 60 now, okay? The Don's getting up there, okay? And uh, that's the, the wins everything. Time wins every wins over everybody else. Um, but I'm still good looking. No, no, it's okay. We're, you know, we're going to joke around a little bit today too because I like to keep some levity into the presentation. But failures are, are happening. And failures are, are a big problem in our field. You know, for the better part of five years in, in the Chicagoland area, I was subcontracted by a big all on force center to fix complications and failures. And it was more the maxillary arch than anything. And it was almost another residency for me. So... You know, dealing with periapplantitis, dealing with orientation, dealing with in the in the different nose, in the middle of the palate. I mean, many many things that came across. You know, we had we were had to become well versed in, and uh, this is still a good portion of my my private practice on a routine basis. But whether we have periapplantitis developing around these all on X procedures or any implants, whether we have oral entry communications, we're all going to have to to get into these things to fix them and be able to do revision type treatment. So that's one of the trends. The next trend is, is in, in, in my practice, in my clinical practice, we don't do all on fours anymore, okay? Um, in my opinion, I think it's an outdated procedure. I think that there's many options that are superior to it and options that are much more conservative and that can be done very quickly. So in our, in our practice, I'm doing all on six procedures, giving people their final nano ceramic or zirconia dentition in as little as 48 to 72 hours. And there are all kinds of benefits of this particular procedure. Um, more importantly, uh, more minimally invasive, less, less bone reduction. Um, and this is not the time to go through these presentations, but I will show you some of this because it's gonna lead up to us building towards incorporating zygomatic implants into our treatment planning process from day one when we look at an upper arch in, in delivering of the all on X procedure. And then where our big thing is now is using zygomatic implants for helping to immediately load a maxillary arch and severe maxillary atrophy and arches that we have to really look at. And you know, we're gonna go back and try to now rebuilding and giving stable dental implant support 
to the posterior maxilla in the poorest quality of bone. And knowing how we do that is, is a real huge part of my practice at this point, okay? So let's just look at a quick thing about revision case therapy. Uh, one of the things that we did out of correcting these, these, these failures in this center and other centers now is one of the ways that an all on four was done and probably still is being done today is you would take measurements based on where your incisal edges of your final prosthesis. And then for prosthetic spacing, you have from the incisal edge of the, the planned prosthesis to where the bone has to be reduced is, is 18 millimeters, more towards 15 and a posterior. So the prosthodontists would go into the room, they would do their vertical dimension registrations, they would have the planned positioning of where the incisal edge would be, and they would then, the surgeon would get the measurement and they would take a saw and they would cut right through the maxilla, reducing the bone to the required amount, but they would stop and not elevate the sinus before cutting through the bone on an, on an occlusal fashion. So what this does is it gives you a huge, and if you can see in the lower left of our screen, this huge oral antral communication that's present, and even though the oral antral communication is very small at this point out of them in the middle screen, is that epithelium fans out into the sinus membrane, this is a problem. And you know, there's a couple of different ways that have been talked about in, in correcting these issues. Um, generally, flap will try to be slide, you know, slided over to the palatal surface. There's also been a couple presentation or not papers that were written on using a resorbable membrane or rotation of the buccal fat pad. When we start getting into you uh, talking about what we're going to do in the posterior with, with zygomatic implants, the rotation of the buccal fat pad is just not something that, in my opinion, is very predictable in this, this prosthesis and this problem. So what we did is uh, I was contracted by a company that produces umbilical tissue for membranes. So we used umbilical tissue uh, as, as a stem cell derivative. And then also we used stem cell cubes. Uh, and it's a product from Allosource. It's a, a 66,000 st uh, stem cells in a 1cc compressible cube. And we would go into the, from the palatal, we'd make our incision here on the palatal aspect, and then we would dissect out from the palatal tissues and mucosal tissue under, um, just underneath the flap. And we would elevate this entire flap into the sinus. These are just a the greater palatine vessels uh, ligated off. And this now, this epithelium that was a sinus communication and into the flap becomes now the new roof of the sinus. And then through layering of, of bone and the stem cells and the membranes, we were able in this presentation in 24 of 25 uh, sinuses to get total closure. And in 24 of, and 25 sinuses, we had total closure. In 24 of the 25 sinuses, we were able to regenerate the posterior maxilla. And you see here, I believe this is a year and a half follow-up. And in some of these cases, they were even actually to have to go back in and have uh, uh, additional bone grafting done and then implants in the posterior. So this is something that we see in, in these types of, of cases. Uh, I'm not being able to move forward for some reason. I don't know why. Uh, there we go, okay. And I'm going to go through this. Now let's look at this 48-hour nanoceramic uh, or zirconia um, type of cases we're doing. This is the new trend. So instead of the traditional four to six month and you know, the conversion for a denture and then from there retrofitting it back in impressions into the final uh, uh, acrylic prosthesis with a bar, um, it, it really, when you start to look at that, is there anything magical about immediately loading implants or going to a final restoration? No, there's not. Even when you do an all on four, you're still loading it that day. You know, when implants came to our, 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 our field in the 50s, in the 60s, you know, that, the old implantologist would, you know, take the implant, they would use blades or frames or, you know, hit these things into the bone. They would make the crowns that day. I mean, that, there's, a year goes on, there's two or three people that I still see that have had blades or, or a, a Ramus frame or something along this line that are still functional and still, still working. And we do know that those they have a tendency to fail also, but there's nothing magical about loading in the implant. When you go get your hip or your knee done from the orthopedic surgeon, they don't tell you you can't walk on it for six months. They tell you to go slow with incremental load. It's the same thing. So for the better part of 25 years, for me, 20 years, I've been loading or provisionalizing implants, whether it's a single tooth in the maxillary interior, all the way to full arch types of, of prostheses and, and situations. So, so here's a patient, okay, Igor. Igor is a, is a friend of mine, and I see Igor on a routine basis. And he's had advanced perio disease for years. He had a couple implants put in by somebody else in the mandibular interior that failed. And it took Igor a couple of years to really kind of get up to the point where he was ready to go. So for Igor's case, we, we had planned on an, upper, an all on six, upper and lower, going into his final nanoceramic teeth. And Igor had, had, a, a, had one of these cases that's bordering on, what, do we have to go back into the zygomatic arch or do something more in the distal posterior? 
So one of the things that we do with this procedure, 40 hours, now this is a done in one case uh, in Chicago. I am done in one Chicago. And those of you who don't know what that is, it's a phenomenal press, uh, phenomenal lab in Jacksonville in a, in a technique that's been developed. And we're able to do these things in a more expedited manner and get these people their teeth in 48 hours. The big thing about an all-on six, though, when we're getting this versus all-on four, it's much more conservative. You know, one of the problems with all-on fours is when we start to get into the, the situation of long-term maintenance. And in my practice, in the revision type of cases for these, these situations, you know, what do you do on a, an individual that's in their 40s or 50s and all this bone is removed for prosthetic space and that case doesn't go optimal, okay? Now, what do we do in a revision case when we have all this bone gone and we need the bone back? You're going to tell these patients that have had this done once before that now they've got to go through grafting. Now they've got to go through ridge augmentation procedures. And then when you do that, are they allowed to have their teeth or not teeth? This is a big problem. So anything we could do to be more conservative on the end of our surgical pro uh, procedure and be more minimally invasive on our approaches is a huge benefit to us. So you can see in this particular case, on, on I, in uh, Igor, we only did five implants on the maxillary anterior. I had some trouble in the maxillary, the maxillary left area here, but I had very good stability, very long implants, 18 millimeter implants in the posterior, engaging into the nasal cortical plate and the lateral peripheral plate. You know, this is another huge thing on maxillary reconstructions and all X, uh, all on X uh, types of procedures. You, you know, we, we have to end our implant in a more definitive bone quality than just letting it sit in the maxillary posterior in, in, in medullary bone. That's just not a good recipe for long-term success. So if we see Isaac and these are Norris implants, you can see Isaac's final lab teeth before they're put in. And here's Isaac post-treatment and in his pre-treatment. And this is two days after surgery when he got his teeth. Okay. So this is something we are doing now on a routine basis in our practice. And it, it's, it's changing our practice and it's changing how we're looking at patients, how patients are coming in to see us when we start getting into these different issues. What is this? Questions live okay, questions live answer. What's the question? Let me see. Sure, sure. Okay. All right, so let's see, Polly Krauser here. I have a special guest with me. Wave if you can see me. How's that? All right, if you could get a 39 centimeter on one implant of the six, would you immediately load it? Um, yes, of course. You know, if you go back to the, the publications that were done and the re recommendations that were done from an all on four, if you can get 130 Newton centimeters on an arch, um, you know, you should be able to load. Now, I think that's low, okay, because I think that there should routinely, you should be able to get much higher than that. And now this is where you come into implant designs also. Some implant designs are just not very amenable to being able to get good stability in especially the maxillary bone. This is where I think Norris has got a huge advantage because their thread design and their thread pitch and their apical thread pitch of the implant is ideal for cutting in, in mechanical integration into the bone prior to load. So I, I would, yes, to answer the question at 39 centimeters, would I load um, and one of the implants? Absolutely. There may be times in a single tooth I might do that, depending on where I'm at and if I'm protected occlusion, et cetera. But you can see in Igor's case here, we're riding that whole lateral peripheral plate in the floor of the nose in good cortical plate stability. These cases have no problems with, with load from there. Just, here's another, this is Mikey. Mike is a good guy, a boxer, you know, for years went on, didn't do anything for his teeth. Um, and then finally, when he came in to see me, you know, he, he was like, listen, I want, I, I, want, I want my teeth, I want them now. And uh, we had a really good relationship between him and I. And you see, here's his pre, his, his post-operative scan. Here's 48 hours later when he got his teeth. You can see a little ecchymosis here under the eyes still. But if we look at this case before and after, this is a beautiful, beautiful procedure. And these are patients that got, they've got good bone, they've got you know decent bone quality where we can get good stability into the either into the the, the lateral peripheral plate or the floor of the nose. And we have enough access here that we can deal with that we can do these types of procedures. But you know another thing too. Let me go back to this X-ray just for one second so we can see this and look at Mikey's case again. If we're up in this area here, you know how many implants I see, and, you know, and we all, listen, we all do this. I, I, I can't even tell you over the 30 years I've been doing this, how many implants that I've had into the nasal floor or into, this, into, the, into the, uh, uh, the, the sinus floor. And you know, when you start looking into all this stuff about zygomatic implants, you start looking into the literature and the recommendations of people like Bedrosian and then the Parisio. You know, there's nothing wrong with putting an implant into the sinus if there's no 
predisposing pathology in the sinus. So we start talking about zygomatic implants and going in different directions in you know, trans sinus or opening sinus windows. I mean, as long as you can manage these issues, that's okay. But you know, in the nasal floor is a little different. If, you're, if you don't have enough bone after you've done your bone reduction, there's nothing wrong with do, doing a nasal floor elevation. It's the same thing as a sinus elevation. The nasal mucosa is thicker. And to go into this region here and to elevate the floor of the nose up a little bit, and then use a, a, any type of membrane, whether it's collagen or a platelet fiber membrane with some grafting material, you're going to increase the bone around the implant and decrease the potential for the patient being aware of anything in the floor of the nose. Now, a, a fair number of cases that I had to solve from this clinic, the issues were getting into, you know, I can feel the implant in my nose, I've got pain in my nose, I mean, my, my cells, of my, my nasal, you know, senses are affected, you know, these problems exist. Let's look at one more case here that's got adequate bone quality before we start getting into the back to talking about. This is Bob. Bob's an interesting character. And uh, he came in, an ex-Chicago police officer, dentist, uh, for five, six years, he went to the VA. They took out his teeth, they did a bone graft, charged him a ton of money for it. And uh, he's been waiting because he didn't, he doesn't like his dentures, but he's been waiting to, to get something done. And he really liked the, the aspect of being able to give him his teeth in, 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 a, in a very, very quick period of time. So let's look at his case, because I think this is another case that's good too. When you start looking at this now, and we start to see what bone volume we have to work with. And I know everybody likes to do guided surgery and say guided surgery is the greatest thing in the world. And you, you know, and, and it may be, or it may not be, okay? I mean, I've done it several times. I think if you need to have that and you want to make things uh, more simple for yourself, or you feel you need that, and able to go into these procedures where we're gonna do conversions or final prosthesis, or just from a standpoint of surgical manipulation, you feel that this is gonna help you, then I'm all for it, okay? But I think there's problems that happen with guided surgery or flapless surgery that people don't pay attention to. And one of them is the quality of bone tissue that we have to work with and the quality of gum tissue that we have to work with. Do we have enough gum tissue? Do we not? But I think this is a problem, especially when we get into long-term maintenance of implants. So look at Bob. Bob is kind of a once in a lifetime case that comes along no, I shouldn't like that. Once a year case that comes along where he has enough bone and tissue where we can do this now. And he's got enough vertical reduction because of his denture wear. Now we need much less of this for nano ceramic or zirconia. So we, we need much, we need, we can have much more bone available to do these procedures than if we're going to do an acrylic all for procedure. But Bobby's got, he's got a great amount of keratinized tissue. Okay. He's got the bone reduction. We don't have to do any bone reduction from the vertical dimension measurements. So this is the kind of case. He's got great bone in the distal aspect with the influence to go. So this is the kind of case we can do from a minimally invasive protocol. Okay. So I'll show you how I do these cases when they're minimally invasive. And he's still got enough bone. But I, I, I'm kind of building into getting into the, 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 the sinus area for the zygoma snow. Do you prefer the Norse cortical implants for immediate load or usual tough or tough too? I, I, I use the tough implants for all these cases, okay? So I don't use any cortical bone implants. If you want to, they feel they work for you. The tough implant, I love the thread design. I love the thread pitch. It gives me the confidence I need in order to get immediate loading. Are you going direct to fixture or are you using them? MUA, we're using multi-unit abutments, of course. Multi-unit abutments, right? Okay, so let's go through this. Now, this video is also, we're changing cameras. It's a little washed out in certain areas, but I'm going to play through it pretty quick myself so you can see this is what we do when we start doing these types of cases. So I'm going to stop this. Hey, how do I stop this? Oh, no, not yet. We're good. We're good. Video is going to be a second off. So let's look at Bobby CT, okay? So in his upper arch, you know, we, as we look, if we look up here into the, the, the maxillary uh, left area, you could see we've got a great volume of bone to work with, okay? And he's got some pneumatization, a little bit of uh, uh, inflammatory infiltrate in the sinus. But, you know, he's got his pneumatization, but still from the, the, the molar premolar area, second premolar area, molar area, second premolar area, first molar area, we've got more than enough real estate here to work with. You know, and once again, from a bone reduction standpoint, he's got enough distance between the arches and we're going we're gonna to flap his bottom and we're, we would just be leveling this off to here, of course. But he's, he's one of these cases we can do this way. So what I do at this point when I'm going to do this, and, you know, I, I don't want to talk negative about this, but I'm going I'm to talk from a conservative standpoint. You know, we've got measurements on our CAT scans. We've got calipers. We can design exactly where we want these cases to go and how we want them to go. So what I'll do is I'm going to notch the areas. I've got my measurements from my calipers. I know from the, the incisive uh, uh, canal where I can go distal. And, you know, you know, we know the undercuts from our CAT scan in third dimension. You know, so this is a case that, in my opinion, is a no-brainer. So let's look at this video right away. So here's our preoperative clinical view. Great zones of attached keratinized tissue. What I'm going to do is speed it up a little bit. So we go in. We've made our notches of where we're at. So I know how much 
where my distal implant's going to be, and I'm going to build mesial coming towards there. And we'll know on the other side also. I'm going to go a little quick through some of this in the beginning from a time stamp. How are we doing in time, by the way? Where are we at? I don't know. Okay. All right. Here's the maxillary left. Same thing we're going to map out. So now I'm going to, I'm going to speed this up a little bit. So what I'll do is I'll go ahead and I'll notch all these areas with a, with a, with a marker, surgical pen, indelible marker, whichever you're going to use is fine. And this is where my, my, uh, my flapless design will be in. All right. Now, one of the things that I see also when we start talking about flapless placement is, you know, you've got to respect that biologic width. You've got to respect the tissue depth to where the crust of the bone is. And when you're putting implants at angles, which I love putting implants at angles, you've got to make sure that one part of that implant, whichever is an angle, has to be at the crust of the bone, where the other one's going to be a little bit subcrestal. So you have to make changes to the bone contours to accept that, so you're not going to set up any type of premature bone loss around here. So I'm going to create my notching in my tissue. You can use a tissue punch if you want. Of this crap, nice tissue, no problem. Let me speed this up a little bit. All right, do this. All the sites here. Let's get to this point just for the sake of time. You're not going to make a flap. Who's asking me if I'm not going to make a flap? Jeannie, I'm sorry. Okay, no problem. No, I'm not making a flap. He's one of these cases where we have the bone quality and quantity. We've got sufficient amount of interarch uh, spaces already there. We're perfectly. There's no reason to make a flap. This comes along very, very rarely to do this case like this, okay? So here's our sites before we're ready to start our, our initial site preparation. In my opinion, multi you know, is pivotal importance in such a prosthetic design. I absolutely agree with you. All right, so we're gonna go in with our, our pilot drill. And, and uh, you know, I, like I said, I like using angles for my implants. I like to traverse more real estate with them. I like the fact that I can go longer in areas than not. And I'm going up to the lateral piriform plate of the nose with these, because I'm getting very good uh, uh, hard bone at the apical aspect of my preparation. So here we're just preparing these, these uh, maxillary right areas. And we've got an 18 millimeter 4.2 uh, Norris tough implant. So this is gonna go in, my drill is set at 50 centimeters. So when a drill stops, we know that we're there. And this is soft bone technique. So I'm undersizing my osteotomies, of course. You know, we wanna have very good stability of the implant we're putting it in. So you can see at this point now that's 50 newton centimeters. I'm gonna speed this up a little bit more just from here. And we'll see the other two implants going in. Here's a 13 millimeter implant now, 4.2 di uh, diameter to tough implant. This is gonna go in the same thing. We're gonna go up to the lateral peripheral plate of the nose. Which will set at 50 newton centimeters, it'll stop. So each one of these implants, I believe we've gotten 70 newton centimeters on. And we're gonna be able to, to go with our loading procedure, no problem, in, in the 48 hours. So I'll go back with my hand torque wrench in a second to place these implants where I want at the crest of the ridge. Here's our hand driver. And we'll go ahead and we're going to get this down to the crest of bone where we should have it. And I, I love their, their hand wrench. Um, this to me is, a, is great. We use it with Zygoma stuff all the time. So let me speed this up a little bit so we can get to the meat of where we're going. Now it's important to, to assess what I was talking about earlier. Like if I'm putting these implants in at an angle, where is my, my most coronal portion of the, the head of the implant? Where's my most apical portion? Because when I'm using that round bird to create my dimple in my tissue, I'm also using that round bird to create that dimple in the bone. Because I don't want to have any of those crest of the implant threads exposed underneath the tissue. That's one of the ways to set up a premature type of peri-implant lesion. So now we're going in with our, our multi-unit abutments and we're going to go back and forth in angles just to make sure where we're at. And I could speed this up to the end for the sake of time. Let's just get this to the end so we see what the, the and there's our multi-unit abutments seated. So like I said, it's, it's nice when these cases do come about because it does simplify the surgical approach, but you have to make sure that your bone quality is good. You have to make sure the width of your bone is good. You have to make sure you've got enough cretinized tissue. And uh, this is one of those cases. So here's our picture again. Here's his post-operative CT. You see we've got all on six upper lower. As I'm coming down here, where's my, what happened to my mouse? Not, there it is. I mean, I don't know where the mouse is at. But, um, it's, uh, it seems to have gone away since they did that. Okay. All right, so here's his, his, his post-up CT, and there's Bobby. At the, at the, at the 72 hours, he got his nano surgery. He's got his uh, zirconia teeth. And uh, he's, uh, he's uh, really happy that it was done at this point in time and done as, as expedited as we could do that for him. All right, let's, let's start talking about zygomatic implants now. So these are all cases, these three cases are representative 
of, of patients that have enough volume, quality, and quantity of maxillary bone when we're doing these all on six procedures. So let's start looking at now getting into zygomatic implants uh, for maxillary atrophy, but it's not only for maxillary atrophy. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a big believer that zygomatic implants are, are only gonna become more prevalent in all of our practices. Um, they're they're, they're gonna become a key part of what we're gonna be doing for revision cases well, they already are a key part of what we're doing for revision cases, but they're going to become a, a huge part of the initial treatment planning process for patients going into these all in X or even uh, uh, partially identical step cases where we've got issues, long-term implants that have failed, that have taken a lot of bone with it, failing sinus grafts. There's all these different reasons that if you want to be contemporary moving forward through this next decade and on, you're going to have to become proficient with these techniques at some point if you're not already. So I have a couple of questions. Let me read them. How do you determine the bone reduction in the case of a high smile line? Well, you've got to be a little bit more aggressive. Okay? You got to be, and Antonio, this is the third question from you, bro. You get two more and then that's it. I'm cutting you off. You understand? Okay. So it, you have to, you have to evaluate where the smile line is. You have to evaluate, you know, where the, the plan final line is going to be. You've got to have your, your, your digital design done because there's a lot of different ways this happens. You know, this is a different topic for a different case. Maybe from Norris, we'll come back to another treatment planning case and how we're getting into these different things. I want to keep moving forward with zygoma, but that's a very good question that we can do. It's saying type the answer. I'm, oh, I'm answering one. Dr. Petrangero, have you used the laser for a punch? You can. You know, whatever you feel comfortable with, you could use a tissue punch, you can use a laser, you can use a burr. Whatever you're comfortable in your practice, I'm cool with whatever works for you. So bicortical fixation is a determining factor here for immediate load. In my opinion, yes. Okay. Now, you may not always be able to get it. You may still get good ISQ on your implants when you put them in, but I, I like bicortical stabilization. Yes. Do you give ceramic teeth in 48 hours even if you raise a flap? Absolutely, 100%. Okay. Okay, let's start talking about zygomatic implants, all right? So, you know, th there are all types of patients out there. There are all types of practitioners out there. There are, there are um, a lot of full arch cases that are probably being done uh, in, in a way or in a realm that they should not be done. And I think that we have to start to understand a lot about the treatment planning process and a lot about where our field, the educators in our field have kept us kind of in the dark about a lot of these procedures. And, you know, when we start getting failures, Okay, we all have to start to look at ourselves again based on, you know, where it is we're going with how we look at these cases, where it is we're going and how we treat the plan these cases. And, uh, you, you know, there, there's, I have a couple forums on Facebook, uh, you know, the International Zygomatic and Turgoid Academy is, 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 is something that I, I run and administrate. And I'm, I'm so proud of it because, you know, I see clinicians from around the world sharing their, their procedures, um, you know, whether it's, you know, turgoid implants, zygomatic implants, you know, other different ways to look at this. And it's really refreshing for me because I always like to look at a different perspective on these cases. But the real thing that's nice for me is that clinicians from around the world are engaging in discussions and cases and examples of what they're doing on these types of, of cases. And I think it's very rewarding for us. So we really have to start to think about where we're going with our field and you know, some of these procedures could be pretty aggressive. I mean, this is a case, we're going to see this for the last case. This will be like a little teaser into part two of what we're going to do. Uh, but this is a, a really sweet lady that came to see me. She was at the Salon Four Clinic in Chicago. She had five different procedures done. She had a pancake maxilla. She had no bone left to work with. They had implants in her nose. And, and it, it's kind of like, you know, when are we going to understand that you can't, you have to have some bone or some structures in order to put implants in. And then the big thing is you got to understand, these people have to have their teeth finished after the surgery is done. So we start getting into placement of these implants and, you know, how thick is the prosthesis going to be and, you know, speech issues. All these things play a role when we get into the initial planning phase of where we're going. So, you know, severe maxillary atrophy is, is definitely an issue that we have to deal with. It may be full arch. It may be partial arch. It could be, you know, uh, unilateral. It could be in the anterior. It could be in the posterior. Um, there's a lot of papers that were written. We just had one. Uh, our second one came out now on, uh, on zygomatic implants. Um, you know, the different thing with them is they're, they're, they're going to get their anchorage into the zygoma, uh, different aspects of the zygoma. I'm going to kind of unveil a, a new technique that I, I pioneered today on 
that's making this pretty much so simple that even the, not the most experienced surgeon could do these on a routine basis if they had to. But you have to understand now we're getting into a different amount of, of dissection and anatomical uh, landmarks and manipulations of tissues. You're talking about anesthesia issues. You're talking about having, you know, there's a lot of little things that go into this that I think that they're very easy for people to accommodate into their practice with the right instruction and tutelage. Let me get a couple of questions here for this right away, okay? Why all on six if the scientific consensus is just with four implants is not enough? That EO, we're not going to get into this discussion. The scientific evidence for four implants may be enough, but long-term success, depending on how it's being done and reproduced all over the world, there are a lot of failures. We're not going to get into that though today. That's not what we're going to say. Um, can you place egos with local anesthesia? If not, is IV conscious sedation adequate or GA? Jim, um, you know, I'm sure there are some people that can do it with local. I mean, we'll do external blocks. I, I am not comfortable doing that. One of my teachers in South America, Santiago Gonzalez, wonderful oral surgeon, dear friend of mine, um, he'll do them with oral sedation, okay, in addition to anesthesia. Um, we, have all, we have all of our anesthesia services are out-serviced. We have an uh, MD anesthesiologist. Uh, all zygoma cases in our practice are done general anesthesia, okay? But I think that you're going to have to get into a little bit more aggressive sedation if that's the case. Do you recommend doing zygomatic implants? Or, okay, that question was answered there. Okay, when I say that zygomatic, when I say that zygomatic implant is better than augmentation, well, I, I think it is. I mean, if, you know, I start telling patients you're going to go into grafting, we're going to do this. It's going to take you know six to eight months of time. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, patients that I see, or maybe it's just the profile of my practice, maybe it's what I want to do. You know, my patients don't want to do all that grafting. They really don't. And you have to understand, so we're going to get to it. We start talking about some cases here that we're going to be showing when the, the change has to be done in surgery to decide to go to zygoma. We're going to start talking about, you know, what are the limitations of sinus graft? You start getting a 10, 20 cc sinus that needs a graft. Does that bone actually ever turn over? Now, this is not a dissertation about sinus grafting versus zygomatic implants, as it is not a dissertation about all in four versus all in six. But you have to start to ask yourself these questions, okay? So the American College of Prosthodontists has come in, and they, they, they made a position statement on this a few years ago. And they said they're a viable option to restore quality of life to patients that, that are looking to have these augmented into the treatment planning phase. Uh, if we go back to, to Oli Jensen's paper that was done, they did classifications A, B, C, D. You know, D was getting into zygomatic and, and vomer type implants. I think you have to be, you have to be aware of that. Uh, first paper that, that we wrote on using them for severe, uh, severely resorbed uh, posterior maxillary areas. It, it, you know, is another one. We just had this one come out. It's in this month's April. It's actually the cover issue on 452 zygomatic implants in a multi-center study with my colleagues in South America and myself you know, a five-year uh, success rate. And uh, quite frankly, it's, it's much, much higher than sinus grafting, okay? And in five years, we're almost approaching 100%. Now, I do treat failing zygomatic implants. I've, had, I've got a couple of doctors that have referred me uh, implants that have fractured. And we have to be prepared for all of this stuff once we start doing this. So is much as I'm saying that this is easy to, in, to integrate into your practice with the right tutelage, you have to understand every procedure we does has some type of potential complications associated with it. And we have to be able to understand those before we start to do it and then move forward with, with, with how we're going to be able to manage these issues when they happen. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those complications in the part two that we're going to be doing at our next webinar. Is it in May? I believe it's in May. Okay. So, you know, when do we do this? When should we do this? Well, you know what? There's really no magical answer. In my opinion, the minute I look at a, a CT and I'm talking to the patient, I don't ever hesitate to say, we're going to have to go do a zygomatic implant here. There are times I'll tell a patient, we are on the border of being able to do an all on six and make sure that we get good stabilization or we're, we might have to divert back to the zygomatic implant in, in the surgery. And I'm, okay, the video I'm going to show you is the perfect example of this why this happens or can happen, and you have to be prepared for this. What would happen at the center in Chicago, which happens, I'm sure it happens a lot of places, they go in there, whether you're doing an all in four or all in six, okay? I mean, I've done zygomatic implants with all in four procedures, so it's not saying you don't ever do that, but you have to be prepared in surgery to do something because what they would do at the center is the case I'm going to show you, which you'll see coming up next to video. This case, they would have had the implant put in, it would have failed, or they would have done a sinus graft, they would take out and done a sinus graft. This patient would be thrown around the circle 
for the next two years, never getting into their final type of thesis. That's just not right. It's not right. You need to be able to manage these things as we move forward. Do you have more questions? Yes. Anybody going to maybe yell at them with the questions or no? Okay. Okay. My, Michael Lewis. What? Okay. Are you using any special program for planning? Dario, that's number two. Cutting off after that. Okay. The program that I use is what we have in our CT scans. Okay. We have an atomage and uh, uh, that's what we use. I don't use any special plannings. Okay. All right. But you can. You can use the you know, Norris. If you ever, those of you looking to get into these types of procedures, there's some really good education that's available. Some really good. We, we do one in South America that we do as far as a, a live surgical protocols. Uh, it's controlled by myself. And, um, you know, I, I don't even like to say it's a second level zygoma training because it's not really the case because you can take some training someplace and then come to see me or you can come see me the first time and do it the right way. But what I'm saying is that you have to be able to understand these things before you, you rely specifically on some sort of guided surgical protocols. But I'll tell you, Norris's Zygoma Guide is wonderful, okay? And for a, 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 a person looking to get into this the first couple of times, I think these types of protocols and these types of, of adjunct procedures and, and, and instrumentation is very, very important. I've done zygomatic implants, which every zygomatic implant that's available out there. I actually designed a zygomatic implant. I gotta, I'm gonna be very, very honest with you when I say this, that the, the design, which is why I'm doing it, okay, that Norris has is head and shoulders above every other one. The abutment options, which we'll see coming up, are head and shoulders above every one. And, and in my opinion, this is the preferred implant of choice for these types of procedures. And I'm gonna show you as we're moving through all this why I say that. But when's I go always? Why would you not want to incorporate this into a treatment plan if the patient needed to have this type of implant done? Or if the patient has a problem with bone quality, okay, are you really giving them all the choices they need if we're not talking about this with them? So I think these are questions, once again, I, I don't have all the answers. Practitioners have to answer these questions themselves, but I think we have to start to look at this from there, okay? All right. What CBCT do we have? The, we have the, uh, the ROS scan. We have two of them. Pain and healing after the procedure. You know, everybody is different. I mean, you know, we have a certain protocol that we follow with patients. Um, the more minimal, minimal surgical approach I'm going to show you that I, I, I like to say that I pioneered is much, much, much less invasive. Um, you know, quad procedures, like that one I showed you, that, that for, she had such little bone loss. You know, we had, to, we had to do a crisscross technique for the zygomatic implants, which we'll, we'll show you coming up in part two. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, a, a, an ultra um, aggressive procedure unless we don't have any anatomical structures to work with. But yeah, I'd like to say it's, it's not much more than a full arch. It just depends on a lot of variables. It depends on the patient's health, depends on their medication levels, depends on their ability, you know, the tissue core. There's so many, you know, how it's managed, how you manage the closure. All these things play a role. All right, so let's, let's look at this x-ray. This is a couple of years old now, but I keep this in here because I think it's very, very important. If you can look at this patient here, where I don't have my pointer, so I'm trying to move this around and I can't, uh, I can't see it. But if you, if you, I can't see the screen. If you look at the maxillary, on, on our screen, the maxillary right posterior sextant here now, okay? So this case was sent to me by a doc. First time I was working with a doctor, and he, he wanted me to put a single implant in the number six position, which is the maxillary canine area. And he wanted to put a locator abutment on it, make a partial denture that would secure itself on the locator abutment and passive rest on the two central incisors. And I told him, I said, I can't do it. And he says, well, what do you mean? I said, I, I just can't do it. I mean, it's not gonna work. There's, wh where do you want me to put this implant that's gonna go in the canine position? There's zero bone, it's all sinus. And then when you look at already the vertical height loss that we have, can I use this up here for a printer? What is this all this here? Can I use this? It keeps coming down. For, a, I mean, a, like a, a mouse. Wait a minute. Well, I can draw. Oh, it is even better. Okay, I'm going to keep going when the team is figuring out what, what, what I have. But if you look up into this cane, I mean, there's just, there's no bone there. So, and then eight, nine, the, the centrals and the lateral are shot. They're gone. So I'm going to go to the next slide. If we look from the, the occlusal standpoint, hold on, guys. Not technical issues. Tech, there we go. Okay. 
if you look from the occlusal side, so you're looking at lateral aspect here now of the maxillary right. And if you look from an occlusal issue where you would have to put these implants in the palatal shelf here, how thick would that palatal aspect of the prosthesis be? And then you're not even going to have enough bone quality or thickness to even get good initial torque on those implants. So this case here is absolutely a zygomatic case on this side, okay? And you can have a single zygomatic implant on one side and a normal uh, all-on X procedure on the other side. And when you look at this maxillary left or maxillary right uh, uh, posterior area, from where the bone loss is already in a uh, apical coronal fashion, going to the distal aspect of the distal inferior aspect of the zygoma is not that much more of a jump to go there. So let's let's look at a couple videos for me. Okay, I got a couple questions. Okay, do you think in special patients like smokers, for example, zygomatic implants has better rate of success. To me, it's it's the same. I treat smokers, I treat diabetics, I different changes in man management issues to these. I don't see any less or superior success rate of a zygomatic implant versus a regular implant in smokers or anything like that. And, I, and it doesn't make me want to do anything different as far as my protocol. How much peri-implantitis mucositis do you see with the zygomas you place? How do you treat and hygiene protocol for management when I send it back to the referral? Thank you, Dr. P. You know, Christopher, you're a gentleman, and you said thank you, and I appreciate that, okay? All right. The number one potential complication for zygomatic implants is lack of poor quality crustal tissue at the head of the implant and abutment complex, okay? So remember now, when you start talking about zygomatic implants, you have the apical 10 millimeters or so of that implant goes into the zygomatic arch. Then you have the, a, 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 a long aspect of the implant, varies on length of the implant from 30 to 60, but you have that middle portion of that implant that is going to be either in tissue or in the sinus or uh, something as far as that's concerned. And then you have the coronal portion, which is gonna be at the crest of the ridge. And you have to be really, you have to understand where all these parts of that implant are doing, okay? So going through the other designs of implants, in my opinion, to have threads in the middle aspect of that implant and the very coronal part of that implant makes a zero, zero sense whatsoever, shouldn't even be part of what you're doing. Also, the middle portion of the implant that's either gonna traverse a sinus, be in the sinus, or be extra maxillary, that aspect having a surface coating on it or some type of alteration also doesn't make sense to me. Why would we have more surface area for bacteria to deal with on a roughened or an altered surface? Makes no sense. Now, it's a very coronal aspect, the same thing. Why would we want a very large coronal aspect to our implant? Why would we want a external hex to that implant versus an internal hex? And really, when you understand what zygomatic implants are and the trajectory that they're going in, which is the most difficult part of learning how to do zygomatic implants, by the way, you're going to need some abutment options, okay? So when we start talking about peri-implantitis or mucositis at the coronal aspect of the implant where it's coming into the soft tissues, this is, a, this is a potential problem. And if you don't have the right closure techniques, if you don't know how to put back some keratinized tissue, you know, this can be problems. And it's not, a, not necessarily problems or failure of the implant because it's integrated so high, but it's a recurrent sinusitis, it's a recurrent peri-implantitis, it's painful, it's tissue issues. These are all things that play a role. And this is why, what I'm gonna show you, my technique that I pioneered, it virtually decreases that to a minimum, okay? And a lot of that is, is due to just flap, size of the flap, and being able to prox you know, do approximation of where you're gonna close the buccal aspect of the tissues to the palatal shelf, okay? All right. You have some training course for zygomatic implants. Yes, we'll do that at the very end, okay? You remind me and I'll talk about what we're doing, okay? All right, so let's look at this. So we're gonna look at three different videos here now. We're gonna go through me talking about the treatment planning process. I can talk over the videos, of course, and I think these are gonna be good examples to what we're discussing either before and after pictures now and how we manage it, okay? So do I just hit here again and play? Let's see. I'm just finding out that you guys can't hear what I'm saying. So, so what I'm talking about is I'm looking at this, this case. This comes from an oral surgeon from Cuba, who's up here now, US, he's a general dentist, but he still knows all of these, these different aspects of surgical, which is really good. And we're talking about here the, the, where the lower teeth are, are positioned. She's not doing anything to her lower dentition versus to where the upper teeth are positioned. I'm trying to make this a little slower. Okay. 
and and looking with how much volume of bone she has. Now, when you see this case, when you see this case in here, and now my pointer's back. When you see this in here, you've got to understand there's not a lot of height from the ape, from the, the coronal apical height here. Your sinuses are very large, and she's against her lower natural dentition that's not going to have any revision done to it. Now, you, in my opinion, in my opinion, you have to absolutely over-engineer this case in the maxillary arch. Okay. So when you start looking at this, can you get six implants in this region? You probably could. They're not going to be very long. And when we're going against a lower natural dentition, and you're talking about the cantilevering forces when you looked at her, her jaw relationships from the lateral view, I mean, you have to be able to understand the limitations of keeping these implants all right here versus going back with the low disc going here. And we're going to have to go back to this area to incorporate a single implant on each side. I mean, I think you have to really, really understand this before you start getting into this type of a case from a tree implanting perspective, because it's, 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 it's very, very critical for short and long-term success, okay? So let me speed it up a little bit till we look at the post-op x-ray. Okay, so let's look at her case now, okay? So here we did the single zygoma on each side, and we've got three implants in the front. We had, tr we had tried to put four implants in the front. I just couldn't get good torque on the, the number, the right central implant. And those implants are only 10 millimeters in length also. So, you know, this case here, you have to think about. Matter of fact, in this case, we went in and we had to do a nasal floor elevation up in this region also, you know, because even the 10 millimeter implants were engaging into the plate. So we come in here, we just do our nasal floor elevation like we would do a sinus elevation. We're back here with our single zygomatic implants on each side. I think this is very, very important for us to realize. We've got our distal molar area here. So we're only going to be cantilevering off one tooth, if any. Same thing on this side. We've got a distal molar, which we wouldn't have if we didn't do the zygomatic implants at this point. And I think that's something that we have to look at there. So let's look at this next case now and see what this one is. Ah. So this is another case, which is the, the CT scan of what I'm going to explain to you at the, or it's the kind of the teaser at the very end of what we're going to be doing. That was the, the all on the, the quad zygoma case. I told you it was very difficult. But this case comes to me from the all on four center. They already had the all on four done in the mandibular arch. And I believe she had six or seven surgeries in her maxillary arch um, from where she was, you know, initially. She has zero crust of bone left. She's got implants up here in this region that are in different aspects of her nose. I'm going to speed the video up a little bit here so you can see a little bit more here. So let, let, let's look at where she's at. So as you're looking at the skeletal view, you know, we've got this implant here on the right side. You know, we've got four implants here. They're into the nasal structures. No elevation was done. You'll see the occlusal view uh, in a second. So, I mean, you, you look at these, the, what's going on back in here. I have no idea what the rationale was in this back area. But if we're looking at this case where these implants are and where these implants have to be trajectory, these implants should be more back into this level from a, from a profile standpoint of what we're gonna be able to put back for her jaw relationship. But when we look at this, this is such a, a small distance in through here with no bone left, we're gonna to have to go back into the zygoma region, okay? A little bit quicker here. Let me see the, let me show you the axial view. Here's, this is now the, the adjacent side, same sort of thing here. You know, these are all on the other side back here. You've got all this distance to worry about in through here, you've gotta be able to change that. Let me get to this point. So let's look here if we're looking so you can see where these implants are put into here. There's no really, in my opinion, rhyme or reason. If you look at the sagittal view, look at how these are in the middle, more in the middle palatal region. And, and you know, what, what, what poor Jamie has been put through here is just, it's just not right. So when she came to see me, she was kind of on her last stretch. She had chronic sinus issues. Uh, we, had to, we had to manage that for her. And she turned into her quad case. So let's go to here again. I'm sorry you can't hear me talking, but you can hear me talking now. So let's go into her post-operative x-rays and see where we're at. So if we're looking here from another planning standpoint, you could see, and one of the measurements we take here is from the, the width of the zygomatic arch as far as this area here, and then of course the proximity of the infraorbital rim. So this is a much more complex case here because you're, you're gonna have to be able to manage the trajectory of these implants. When I was saying earlier, one of the hardest things in these cases to be, understand is when you're going in with a 50 millimeter implant here, the trajectory that that implant goes from the crust of the ridge to put it in the right restorative space to minimize palatal thickness of the prosthesis 
That's what's difficult in zygomatic implants. That's where the training comes in. That's where the mentorship comes in. That's where, or that's where your surgical guide comes in. Like I said, the Norris guide is phenomenal. But you have to understand the apical coronal height of the, the zygomatic arch. Now, on Janie on this side, is great because look at how wide her zygomatic arch is. That's it. This is the complex side is on her right, on her other side. So let's look at her postoperative CT first. Then we're going to go from there. So here, here's Janie's postoperative CT scan. Okay. So now you can see in her case, because of the width, you can see the proximity we are here. You know, this is something, you know, you, know, you need to know how to manage this area. Okay. You know, in this particular area back here, you can see the crisscrossing pattern that we did. So this one is on the, the more uh, facial aspect. This is the more palatal aspect. And you can see that we've got good integration of bone around both of these on this upper uh, left side. This is a very complex case to deal with in understanding where she's at. Here's her final restoration, which uh, she got her final restoration. She was moving to Florida, was done in a month. Okay, so we converted initially, then we went to the final uh, analysis around making a month, but there's no reason to wait longer in these cases unless you actually want to. So look at where we're at here now with our, with our placement of our implants from a trajectory standpoint. We've got our molar, we've got our anterior site, we've got good lip support. And we, we, in my opinion, we've done a really nice thing here for Jeannie, who, was, who had a lot of stuff done that was, was, was problematic for her. So in part two, we're going to be going through her case in detail and outlining that whole procedure as far as that. But I think you get a little idea what we're starting to talk about from a treatment planning perspective. Let me go to the next one because I want to go through this kind of quickly because, you know, we have about 35 minutes left. Let me answer some questions right away. Are there questions? We're going to this one. Okay, that's good. All right. How do you prevent recession? Mike, it's, it's tough. It's flat management. I'm going to show you that my procedural technique that I, I feel that I pioneered, which is going to really decrease that and how you manage flat, but it's flat management. It's understanding tissue quality. Sometimes you have to add in, I add in umbilical tissue on cases I think are really problematic that are going to be recession. You can add in some tissue grafting. Um, you know, there's doctors that like to rotate the buccal fat pad to try to increase tissue thicknesses, but it's going to, it's going to come to how you close. You're going to have to know how to do. You're going to have to know how to do bone hole suturing if you don't know what that means. You're going to have to be able to stabilize your flap so it doesn't move. Okay, here's a here's Kurt. I would agree. I've been doing zygoma, zygomas for over 20 years, probably longer than most practitioners. No question, better than augmentation of the sinus, but cost factors are the limiting factors in the majority of cases. It's also one of the most difficult of implant procedures and takes time. I agree with the difficulty in taking time. Also, I've only done cases under general anesthesia. When asked why are they so successful. I said from the beginning, but can't prove it, it's endochondral bone and not mesenchymal bone. Just a thought. Absolutely. Where's the best bone in the mouth, everybody? Right here. Where's the second best bone? Right here. Okay. You're dealing with bone quality. You're dealing with getting that implant and with a high NSQ. Now, with the norozygomas, I've never had one under 50 newton centimeters. As a matter of fact, most of them, their, their drills are really good, which you'll see me using them in videos coming up. It's very easy to get good initial torque on your implant when you're using the system. So that's a very, very important, Kurt. I agree with you 100%. Augmentation of cost concerns, you know, from a cost pricing standpoint, I don't charge much more extra than these than I would for science scraft. So, you know, that standpoint is something that it just, to me, it makes all the difference in the world and it's the right thing to do. But, you know, fees are different for everybody in every part of the country and the world. You got to understand that. Here's Mike again. Mike, number five questions, baby, after this, no more. What do you think of Corey technique grafting coronally with black grafts? done by Dr. Ruiz and Ibiza. I, I don't, I'm not a grafting person anymore. I don't do the grafts. I think they're aggressive. I think that you got prolonged treatment times. I've seen beautiful stuff with it. And if it works for these doctors, I think it's great. We don't do that in our practice. Which zygoma implants are you placing first, the anterior or the posterior? Rami, depends. Depends on the case. Usually I'll do the posterior one first and then go to the anterior. But in that case that I was just showing, the lady that had those implants put in at the on force center, when you're doing a crisscross technique, you have to drill the, the anterior one first. Then you got to drill the posterior one. You got to put the posterior one in because you're going inferior distal in the zygomatic arch. And then you put the anterior one in on top of that. So it kind of depends, but I prefer to do the posterior one first. How far are you from the orbit? Mike, sometimes you're close. Now, there's a couple of things you have to do in the surgery. This is why the education and the mentorship is very important. In understanding where you're at, you've got to be able to palpate structures. You have to be able to dissect structures. Dissect, you, you got to know where you're at, okay? What is your AP spread? It depends. I mean, you know, I'd like to have them in the first molar region on a quad case. And in a quad case, I'd like to have them in the lateral incisor region. Sometimes we have to sacrifice a little bit from each side. But generally, the AP spread for me, ideal, would be first molar and lateral incisor. Okay? Let's look at another quick extra here now. Here's another page. This is Jenny. 
So Jenny had uh, the all on four done at, at the, at the center years ago, and she had some single implants around built around teeth, and she was losing the natural teeth and the implants at, at this particular time. So we start looking at Jenny's maxilla and what she's going to have left when all this stuff is taken out of here. And you can look up here, look at the bone loss up into this region. Okay, now she's got some bone here, even though these are periodontally involved. And then look at the bone loss up here. So if you're going to look at her case and, and keep her treatment into this region here against a lower integrated all on X procedure on the mandibular arch, I, I don't think it's going to have very good long or short term success, to be honest with you. So, in this particular case, you're going to have to understand what you've got back here. Now, you can take these teeth out if you want. And you can go ahead and do grafting in this region and put them in a denture or put a couple of implants in the front and maybe secure a, a, some sort of temporary. That, that's fine if you want to do that and you want to go into prolonged treatment times with, with advanced grafting. That's fine if that's, that's the, the protocol of your practice and how you do these cases. Um, in my opinion, you're, you're, you're getting into trying to build bone quality that is very poor bone quality to start with. And by doing grafting, thinking that you're going to convert that bone quality into very good bone quality. And then how long is the case going to take you? Patients, how long are they going to be in some sort of a movement prosthesis? I don't know about everybody else, but patients that are coming to see me want these things done. They want, they love the immediacy. They love the one procedure. They love being in their final dentition. And this is, is getting to the point now where, where, where you have to be cognizant of the fact is this is not only treatment planning, this is delivery, this is implementation, this is getting patients back to their normal lifestyles and, and what they want to do on a much more expedited basis. And in my opinion, much more conservative than multiple surgical procedures. Remember, surgery is damage, it's controlled injury, okay? And we have to understand that every time we go in here to do one of these things, we're creating some damage. Let's get to our post-operative case. All right. So you can see we were able to get four implants in the interior, very good AP spread. We've got our single zygomas in the back and uh, Jenny had her final bridge within the month on this case, just because of some travel she was doing. We converted her, her we had her in a pre-existing uh, uh, acrylic prosthesis for 30 days and then she got her final prosthesis. Do you incorporate turgoid implants? Uh, occasionally I do, I don't do a lot of them. I think if you, you want to see this stuff, Danny Hosclaw does a beautiful job on turgoids. Um, but to me, I, I'm more into the zygoma uh, treatment on a routine basis. Um, occasionally, one of the things that I, I'm a little, I don't like about turgoid implants is getting into the distal thickness of the prosthesis in the area. That's something that I don't do. So, but, but I think Danny's going to have something come up. He does a phenomenal job with them. Play, plasma rich fiber and always preferred while closing over implants. You know, Tashar, I think if you can do it and you have it, it's always nice to do any type of a, a, a growth factor or some sort of healing enhancer on a flap that's not going to be sitting on bone. I think that's a good question. Uh, do you have a therapy protocol to accelerate bone healing process of the implants? Do you use laser photomodulation? No, I don't use laser photomodulation. Um, you know, uh, Jorge, I think that it's load. I think load stimulates bone formation and good bone quality. I think that that's where we go. But look at here again. There's our zygoma implants. Each one of the implants are on the lateral piriform plate. You can see we've got a good AP spread. And this is just another way to manage these cases. Because I, I think you need to know how to do this. So we've got more questions. When you place the zygomatic implants, what percentage of the cases do you use a surgical guide? Uh, Jimmy, I do them, uh, some of them with the Norris guide. Uh, but most of my cases now, with, with where I'm at, my experience level, I, I, I do these uh, by dissection, visualization. And we have a prosthetic guide to tell us where we need to have our, in, our heads of our implants. But I, that's, that's kind of my protocol. What's the best position for quadrozygo, for your opinion, in the ideal situation? Uh, I think I answered this one already. Uh, for, 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 where is it again? Ramon, I think I answered that. Uh, best positions would be first molar for the distal implants and then the, the lateral incisors for the lateral incisor canine region for the anterior implants. I think that's the best. All right, let's move forward. So let me let me get into now incorporating these into to a treatment planning phase. Okay, you know I, I think that zygomatic implants are are here to stay. I think they're going to continue. There was some uh, some long term uh, some uh, research committee that did a study of the increase of zygomatic and turgoid implants uh, uh, over the next ten years, and I think their growth rate is supposed to be into like 20, 25 percent per year. Now, I don't know all of the demographics of the study and all that stuff, but I, I think what we have to understand is zygomatic implants are here to stay. And I think that by understanding 
the treatment planning phase, understanding the um, delivery and the, the, the restorative aspect of these and what the restorative aspect means to the surgical manipulation, I think are, are very, very, very important to any clinicians that are routinely doing maxillary for large procedures. You, you just have to, you have to. If you're not, you're lying to yourself, okay? And whether you want to do grafting or not, there's always going to, there's a need for me to do grafting sometimes with these. I'm not saying I don't ever do a sinus graft. I'm not saying, I, but I, you have to understand there's no 100% of anything and you have to be able to, when you sit down and do surgery for a patient, they are paying you to do the right thing. And you have to understand and interpret in certain cases, certain procedures are of paramount success rates to others. And in certain cases, they're not. And you have to understand and make that decision for yourself to understand what you're going to implement. So what I did is I, and I, I don't know how many zygomatic implants I've done. I, it doesn't really matter. We have, you know, five years we've been doing them. The success rates are where they're at. And we incorporate them into different types of plans all the time. But I, I think what we have to, to understand is we have to get rid of some of this, this stigma with zygomatic implants. Oh, they're aggressive. Oh, there's complications. Yeah, there are. There's complications in anything we do, okay? And, and somehow get this more into mainstream maxillary reconstructions that people are doing on a daily basis. So what I've done is I've, I've taken a little twist on an extra, extra maxillary approach, and I have come up with a very, very easy flap design, dissection technique, and manipulation of the zygomatic malar process area to be able to routinely, routinely be able to get your distal zygoma implant in the first or second molar region routinely. Right? It basically puts you in the first or second molar region. And this is something that I, I feel that any clinician that's doing full arch surgeries right now, whether you're a specialist or you're a general practitioner, can do this on a routine basis in our office, okay? So um, I'm gonna write a paper on this and present it, but this is my technique that I, I have kind of pioneered. It keeps you totally away from the sinus. If you look here, I don't have my pointer, but if you look, to the medial aspect of where the zygoma implant is here. That's the sinus, so you're not going anywhere near the sinus, and you're not going anywhere near the infraorbital rim. You're distal to the infraorbital rim, and you're distal to the maxillary sinus. This, in my opinion, is a home run for dentists to do on a routine basis. So let's look at this case now, because this case, to me, is everything that we need to talk about when we start talking about incorporating zygomatic implants into cases. When you're doing an all on X procedure, and you, you, you have problem with that distal implant, what we have to divert back into, okay? So I think this case is paramount, important. Before I get going, do there any more questions I can answer? I really wish you could hear me in a video because I'm really good at video. I, 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 I'm gonna talk about it when we see it, but I'm pretty good. Okay, there we go. What is the long-term prognosis of such cases? Well, we just did a five-year 452 site implant study, that's 99.5% success rate. In my opinion, zygomatic implants are 50%, if not higher, more successful than the distal implant and the maxillary atrophy case you're trying to get good stability on. Because in that center for five years that I had to fix, most of the complications came from the distal maxillary implant failing prematurely and leading issues to the anterior failing, okay? So in my opinion, much more. That's why I don't do the sinus grafts or grafting in these posterior areas anymore. You can do whatever you want to do in your practices. I don't have all the answers, but you have to make decisions based on what you can handle and what you want to do on what's going to give you the highest success rates. What if some zygomatic implants don't get enough torque because bone density is bad? Do you immediately reload? Okay, Omar, the answer to your question is yes, because you're splinting. I don't understand the techniques and the procedures with zygomatic implants of putting the zygomatic implant in and then not engaging it. It's counterproductive in my opinion. It makes no sense to me. Now, if I'm going to put a zygomatic implant in, this is why you have to know what zygomatic implants you're going to use, because some designs of zygomatic implants are inferior to others. Now, when your thread design at the apical portion of your zygomatic implant doesn't have a big thread pitch, it doesn't have a cutting apical thread, you're not going to get very good torque. You're just not. You need an implant that's got good thread pitch, it's got aggressive thread design, so that when you're cranking these, I have never, matter of fact, the first, the first Norris zygomatic implant I did, whatever years ago it was, I had to rep in from the office and we're talking. And I go to put the implant in, and I'm used to, with the other systems, going with my 2.9 millimeter drill and then making sure I'm going to get torque, then going back in with the implant, and you would only go one drill, and you would sometimes still not get that torque because the threads weren't good. Well, the first one I did, I'm going to do the same thing. I use the first drill. I go to put this, I go make it, but I can't, I can't turn it. 
I'm like, what? And she says to me about thread design. And I'm like, listen, I'll tell you about the thread design. <laughs> so I had to go back again and go to the second drill. Okay, the next diameter up. And now I'm cranking this baby in. And I got to be honest with you, that's unique for zygomatic implants. That's the Norris advantage. There's a lot of cases you have to go to the third drill to be able to get the implant to take. I have never put in a Norris zygoma implant in and did not get did not get a minimum of 50 newton centimeters. Those of you who know me don't know I don't BS about this stuff. Okay, I'm I'm routinely going with my hand torque wrench or the hand uh, uh, screwdriver to place it to the depth. So I'm I am routinely getting above 50 newton centimeters on these implants. That's why they're that's why they're in my practice. If your overall arch ISQ is less than 120, do you add turgoids? Mike, you can do that if you want. You can add the zygoma too. Okay, if you want to add the, the, the turgoid to give it to you, you can. Remember, you know, the, 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 the old guy said you get 120 newton centimeters, you're good. You, you have to understand load distribution, occlusal forces, cantilevering forces. There's a lot of things that go into, not only just because you have your torque reading or whatever you're using that says you're 130 newton centimeters means everything's okay. You got to take other factors into account just besides the loading. Billy, Polly, it's Bill. Will you show some of your dissections of the zygomas? Yeah, we're going to see this coming up here in the, the video I'm going to show. Hope everything's good down in Nashville. Have you ever had to remove a zygomatic implant? How is it removed? Warren, absolutely. I get cases failed to me. My own personal physician is a quad case that saw a big oral surgeon in the city of Chicago. So I'm going to see Paul. I had to cut him out. Um, it's a little different because what I do is it, when they are failing, I'll go up to the base of the zygoma arch. I'll cut them off. And then I'll use a trephine and I'll take a trephine and, and hopefully they're the older designs from other companies because with a trephine, you could take it out and put a Norris one right in because the threads are, are, are big enough. Um, you know, sometimes you have to manipulate them a little bit different, but what I don't, what I do is I'll, I'll cut it off at the base of zygoma. Now, if I have, if I can go to my technique and go distal in, in from the lateral, I leave the end in. Why take it out? Okay. But I'll have it flush with the bone, but that happens. The next level of specialty is going to be how do you manage these cases when something happens? Okay. We've got all kinds of stuff we're going to talk about in part two. Part two. So don't ask me the questions of part one about medications, nasal medications, complications. How do we manage these things? You know, there's one, one person I heard talk about zygomatic implants said there are no complications. You know, you know what? There's complications with everything we do. You got to know how to manage. Okay. Is it possible to have a zygoma surgery in the private practice? Or do you always need a clinic for an emergency? Enrico, baby, we're in my practice. I got my private practice. We've got an OR in my practice. We've got a general anesthesia machine. You could do them in your office. There's no problem. What do you think of implementing dental burrs before placing the Norris implant? Uh, I'm, I'm going to assume what you're talking about is what you'll see coming up is when we're going to do the zygoma case. I like, nor I love Norris's diamond burr. And in order to get that started, you need a little dimple into the bone where you're going to place it. So I will use a dental long shank number six or eight round diamond to start my osteotomy. And then I'll go in with the gold diamond before I, before I prep. I, I'm assuming that's what you're asking, Mike. Okay. Dennis, Dennis first. No, I don't do any osteodensification with this. There's no need to in this bone. Bone's good. Okay, let's move forward. All right. So let's look at her case. So if we're looking at the maxillary right, she's got plenty of bone to get my distal implant in the all-in six or all-in four into the, in the second molar, first molar region. But the maxillary left's a little different. That sinus is pneumatized a little bit more and a little more anteriorly. Her, her, she's got less apical coronal height of the posterior maxilla to the floor of the sinus. And I already know that this is going to be very tight for me back in this region when I go in with that distal aspect of what we're dealing with. Okay. So now I'm going to try to since we can't hear the, the me talking in the operating room, I'm going to try to just kind of talk over what we did. But let's look at this, okay? So I'm introducing myself, okay? You know, the implant, Don, that's me. And this is real time in surgery. Okay? I had a gentleman from Germany with me for the week. And um, we're, going to, we're going to see now what happened in this case. So this was an all in six, 48 hour uh, nano ceramic case. And um, we get, we, maxillary right was done, but we got to the maxillary left. We're able to get the distal implant in. But when we went to put the abutment on it, the implant was spinning, okay? So you're going to see now the periapical x-ray of what we had, because I took a periapical at that point in time to confirm where I was at, okay? Now we're going to see this, and we're going to talk about why sinus grafting is not going to work in a case like this. You already had some ridge grafting done with extraction of the uh, maxillary molars in the posterior area. That was done uh, a couple of years before. So the bone quality was 
terrible, okay? Not enough good support. Um, and we had to go back a little bit more. So let's, I'm gonna speed this up a little bit more. Let's go. Okay, so let's get into this for a little, all right. So, so where we're at now, this is the 48 hour t uh, case. So now this is where I had my distal implant for the all in six. This is in the second premolar, first molar region. So if we're looking over in here now, this is the posterior maxillary left. This is where the ridge graft was done several years prior. I was gonna go back here to the tuberosity. There was no good bone quality here. Turgoid would put me back into this region. This particular patient was very, very particular about speech and what she wanted as far as thickness of the prosthesis. That's why nanoceramic or zirconia because it can be much thinner than the acrylic. And that's why you don't need to take much more bone reduction. So you see up here, here's the lateral piriform plate of the nose, okay? So I'm looking to go, if I'm gonna to try to make this work, I need an 18 or 20 millimeter implant to go from this region all the way up to the lateral piriform plate of the nose, okay? You know, and maybe longer, maybe a 24 millimeter implant. So then what I said is to myself, okay, let me, listen, let me see if I can go from the, the distal underneath this implant into the incisive canal where the cortical plate is, okay? I still gotta get my restorative head where the instrument is, but as I was doing that, we just, just you know, she had decent palatal shelf that she could work with, but once again, I couldn't get it at this point because this whole, all this gave away. So now, here's your sinus. Now, this, this is where I opened up here, but this was paper thin. So as I was elevating the sinus, this was all peeling away. Now, if you're gonna say to yourself, with this hole in the bone, with this poor quality of crustal bone, and you're gonna come in here and do a sinus graft and wait, in my opinion, this, is, this does not carry a very good success rate long-term. It just doesn't. So this is in surgery. Now, you can graft this and close it up. She's got five implants and you can build her a temporary and she can wear the temporary for six months or a year and do another surgery. You could do all that or you could do this, okay? Now, this is my simplified approach, even though this is opened up. This is real time because this is the stuff that happens in surgery. You need to know how to manage this in surgery, okay? So I'm gonna go, I'm gonna forward the video a little bit. So I'm gonna come back to here and we're gonna start looking at, all right, so where are we going now in this area? Let me go back a little bit more. Let me go back. Okay, let's go back to here. Now I'm going to stop this for a quick second. Okay, all right. Now, here, here is your sinus. Okay, now this is where probably everybody that's watching this does sinus graphs. Okay, you're going to make your opening. Maybe you're not going to go this high in the in the apical fashion, but you're going to make your lateral wall right here. Okay, to do the sinus graph. All right. Now we're going up to the, the ascending zygomatic arch. Here is the infratemporal fossas where the suction tip is. Here is the beginning of the zygomatic arch. Infraorbital rim is up here, okay? Up here is the infraorbital rim. So now you're going from where you would make a sinus graft. Here's a lateral wall of the maxilla, all right? Now you want to get good AP spread back in here for this distal implant. You don't want to have it in the you know, second premolar region, cantilever off two molars, okay? Or if you're doing first molar occlusion, that, that, that would be okay. But how much more difficult is it to get back to this region to manipulate the area? In my opinion, it's not that much more difficult. I mean, you need to know anatomy. You need to know how to manipulate the tissues. You need to know how to manipulate the masseter muscle, which we're going to get to in a second. But this is not a big jump going from here, from here to here it is if you're going to go up to this range. But from here to here, this is not a big jump, okay? Now, I'm hoping they're seeing me using this pointer, okay? From here to here is not a big jump. Now, let's go forward in the video a little bit more, okay? So let's, let's play this and see where we're at, okay? So now. So what I've done now is because I've already got my flap, which is bigger than I would make normally. So I'm going to put some gauze back in the infratemporal fossa just so we can see our manipulation. But now from here, I've already got this flap made in the, in the tuberosity region. So I can do a little bit of vertical and I can dissect this area going on. I'm, I'm putting some gauze in with some one of 50,000 xylocaine. Okay. Um, this is going to drop the sinus because there's a little bit of hemorrhage. So her pressure, and she was a general, her pressure was a little bit, uh, uh, they and NC I'll just managing it for me. But if we start to look into here now, look at where we're going from this region off into this lateral distal aspect of the zygomatic arch. And here's where the zygomatic arch is curving out into the malar process. Well, if you've got good thickness of bone where I'm here with my probe, why can't you go here to put, this is an extra maxillary approach that's a little bit more designed for restorative platform finishing. So, I mean, I've already got my, my area back in here. I've dissected a little bit of the master muscle here. Now, normally, when I'm doing a zygomatic implant, if I'm coming in and dealing more towards the distal aspect of the infraorbital rib, I've got to cut the masseter to get back there, okay? You're not going to be able to reflect that tissue with, with, with that anterior portion of the masseter muscle insertion, okay? 
But if you look up here, here's a little bit of the infraorbital rim right here, okay? Okay, uh, infraorbital frame, and I'm sorry, it was up here. So as, a, so as I'm looking back into this region here, okay, up and through here, this is an ideal landing spot for me to be in where the probe is. And it's gonna get me into my second molar region, okay? So let's let's get rid of me talking again. Let's go back a little bit more up to here now. Let's go back, 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 back. Oh, that was Zena. Why are my head surgical nurse Zena there? She, she likes to take a little bit of the front. There's Zena. And there's Rosa. Okay, let's go up. Now, here's my little thing again. We just saw that picture. Let's go to here now. All right, let's insert that. So now what we're what we're doing here. Okay, let me stop this for a second. All right. So what we're going now, imagine. So here is the infratemporal fossa. Here's the zygomatic arches that's going out towards the distal, right? And we're going back here is Mailer, Mailer process back here. Okay, so if we're going to get into this region and come into the molar, this is a no-brainer. Now, we obviously were in the sinus because of everything we did over here. But normally, this is extra sinus, extra infraorbital rim. It's, I'll start my little notch here with the dental burr like I just was talking earlier. And I'm going to use the Norris's diamond burr. I'm going to cut my trough into the crest of the ridge. This is a no-brainer, guys. This is something that everybody can do. It's it's much more conservative than going into a more mesial approach, which you can. But if you're going to do a quad case, you do your distal one here, and then you have all of this real estate up here for your anterior one. So, you know, this is my technique that I think is 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 very simple to do. So let's look here. So here's Norris's diamond bar, which I love. It's it's a really great design to create that trough. Normally, we'd use acrylic burrs for this. Now, if you see up here, I'm going too fast. So. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to take this, this uh, architecture of the bone here. I'm going to use a number 10 round carbide that I would normally use for bone reduction or opening up a lateral window in the superior aspect of the, of the sinus. Because normally what I would do in the old days, I would come into here so I can visualize all of my zygomatic archer. I'd make a window in the superior aspect of the sinus, which you're basically here anyway. You take away this little thin bone here and you're there. But now I'm just going to create a little landing spot in this bone because you're going to see the thickness of the bone coming up in a second. So that's a little landing spot for my bird to go before I'm using my diamond burr. Get rid of a little bit of fascia. Because in this level here, I only had to remove a little bit of the masseter fiber because this is where the masseter muscle inserts right here. And it goes all the way up this area. So I've only had to remove and cut a little bit of the masseter muscle here to get to this area. And I already know that my bird from here is going to come. That's where I use our diamond burr in through here. Okay. All right. So. So here, here's the Norris burrs that I'm talking about. So here's the first, as I go, there's a short one along with this. This is a short one, of course, okay? Now, what I like about them is you've got your millimeter tick marks. You'll see the numbers on in a minute as it rotates. But this angled in tip here is just very, very uh, uh, aggressive, but also designed to give you that good torque when the implant goes in. So now I've already, I've done my, my crustal uh, approach with my diamond burr. I've got my landing ground here done so i know where i'm at as far as how thick this area is now, i usually caliper in here to tell me how thick it is but let's go ahead and we'll, we'll go through our drilling procedures so you can see now i'm going into the area i'm going to get this the drill bit's going to go almost 10 millimeters into the bone and we're going to stop our burr but we're going to know where we're at as far as our me measurements are right here on the area so i think we're going to do a 45 or 47 millimeter burr or more millimeter implant now i'm going in with my measurement device to see where i'm at up into the region and then at this particular point you're going to go extra oral okay with your finger and you're gonna be able to feel where you're coming through the superior aspect of the zygomatic archer. This way you'll know, you know how, where you're at as far as anatomically, but you also know on the length of the input you're gonna choose. And this is all extra maxillary. Here's my little device again. I'm gonna go up here. It's got a little hook on it so you can feel where you're at. You know, before you would go to the superior aspect here to release, this is much more conservative than uh, how the older procedures used to be by dissecting all the way up that whole aspect, which you can still do. So here's our, our implant here now. Okay, so we're on the handpiece. Here's the handpiece at 50 Newton centimeters this set. Okay, so when it stops, we're at 50 Newton centimeters. Now we're not all the way in yet. Okay, all right. So it's going to bury itself out. That's it. It's not going anymore. That's 50 Newton centimeters. And you can see where we're at here as far as where the implant's sitting. I'm going to go back to this one more little second. I'm going to go back here for a second. All right, let me put this stop. Okay, so if you could see here now, there's a lateral wall maxilla. Here's my implant in the zygomatic arch and the width of it before it goes into malar. Here's my implant in the second molar region and, and where my implant is at the crest of the ridge. Now I could manipulate this from a periodontal, prospect, periodontal prosthetic perspective easily. We can do that. But this I believe is ideal. Let me go to the end of this because I think we're coming to the end here. 
And then we go, this is what I love about Norris too, is you've got different types of abutment uh, options. You've got from a straight to a 60, mil, uh, 60, millimeter, uh, 60 degree angled abutment. This I think is a 52 uh, millimeter abutment, which is gonna allow me to minimize my prosthetic thickness on the, on the, the, the prosthesis based about where this, this abutment is gonna come out on the crest of the ridge. And I love that. I think that's great. All these options are, are, are wonderful and very, very important to have. Let me speed this up a little bit to here. So we get to the end. What? You can still answer questions. Oh, I got an extra couple of minutes to answer questions and talk. Oh, wait, wait, we're going. See, you leave. Stop talking to me because I'm in here. So let's go back to this, okay? So here, here's the still photo of where we're at. So you see now, here's the implant, extra maxillary approach conservative inc incision now it's going to be even more conservative in the next case you're going to see because I'm, I'm keeping this to where it is but normally you know you're going to make this incision you're going to make your incision up the zygomatic arch and you know you've got one flap distal here you've got another flap mesial here this is now making incision to about right here at this level and then normally because this was already done from what i was my incisions i was making from my all in six and then you could do dissection up and through here just with the periosteal elevator up to where the mass of the muscle inserts here and then you just you peel it off or cut it off to fashion to the muscle, move it distal, and my implant's going right into this area. Okay, so this is my approach. This is my procedure that I I I, I want to say that I pioneered. I think it's a winner. Okay, and I think this is going to make this more and more available to to people in a, in a in a routine basis. And you can see my closure here. Okay, look at the keratinized tissue around the closure, around this area, and it's just bone hole sutures. So bone hole sutures is where I'm putting my sutures through the buckle to the palatal shelf through the bone. And then securing the flap over it. Okay, all these are done with bone hole sutures in addition to a continuous limb. Okay. All right. So let's look at so he, so here is the post-operative CT scan. So you can see here on the maxilla again. Oh, I can't my 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 printer. No, it's okay. It just does it when I go to these. I can't use the the, the uh, arrow. But you can see on the right side coming around to the left side, all of these implants are in the lateral piriform plate of the nose, and you can see the single zygomatic implant. It's back there in the, the zygomatic arch, away from the sinus, away from the orbital rim. So I think this is a, is a great thing. Let's look at uh, another case here. I'm going to go through this as another video. Another edentulous patient, okay? And it looks like he's got great bone on the maxillary arch, but he's, his sinuses are very pneumatized, okay? Uh, we don't have to worry about doing too much bone reduction, all right? Just flatten it off. And the same thing on the mandibular arch, you just flatten it off. But still, his his amount of bone in the in the maxillary anterior is not very good so if you look in here again now unless you're going to start getting into the the distal areas of where the second molar or, or first molar would be premolar and go trans sinus up to the lateral piriform plate of the nose and you're going to need a 24 millimeter implant to do that you know the other option is you know the problem is is looking in the upper right of the screen he's got a knife edge ridge in the maxilla so you know now we've got this complicating the issue of how much bone we have left so, you know, you got to look at this from this point in time and understand this is not a simple all on X procedure in the maxillary arch. It's just not. And you have to understand how to manipulate this, this case and how to manage this case from the get-go to, to make sure you're going to be able to work here. And if we start to stretch out the scan and you start looking at it, where our zygoma is and how much bone we have to work here, why wouldn't you divert back to this area and, and add extra security and support into this region so that you can have, you know, you can, you can get into this case and know that you're going to be successful long-term. You're, you're going into more dense type of bone that's going to be able to give your distal strut of your maxilla against that hinge of the mandible as it's closing on a routine basis, much higher success rate. So let's go through Bobby's surgery right away. Um, here's his maxillary arch. And uh, let's, I'm going to speed the video up a little bit. Let's go through it. So crestal type incisions, don't move my coffee on me. All right, I'm going to answer the question in a second. All right, crestal incision. Would you mind commenting on your preference of utilizing a Minnesota retractor for flap reflection as opposed to zygoma retractor? Anonymous. Uh, you know what? I think you use whatever you can. My brother, Andrea Tedesco in Italy, just came out with a beautiful design of some surgical zygomatic instrumentation. I hope he's going to send me one. I'm talking to him tomorrow on the phone. You know, his zygomatic retractor is great. Uh, oh, look at this incision here. This is a more traditional type of incision in this case that you would make for the zygomatic implant. All right, so this is a little more traditional. My opinion, my new procedure is going to be much more conservative than that. So it, a lot of it depends on personal perspective. If you're going to do my type of technique, a Minnesota retractor is more than enough because you're not going up to the superior aspect of the malar process with reflection where you have to see up above the zygomatic arch. But it's whatever you feel comfortable with. 
No PB to get to the infratemporal fossa. No PB. Mike, I don't understand what that means. Yeah. All right, so you see our flap reflection here, okay? I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. You know, some of these edentulous cases are, are more difficult than the dentu, dentate cases, just because of the fibrous adhesions that are there from long-term denture uh, use and wear. All right, let me speed this up. We, this is just taking valuable time. All right, so let's look up here. Here's the maxillary right. So as you can see, I'm going through my reflection here. The distal aspect is back here. Zygoma is over here. Here's the crest of the ridge. Just so you see where we're at. I'm going to up here. I'm going to locate where my infraorbital uh, foramen is. And then you see the fascia of the masseter muscle is right back in here. Okay. And here's the infratemporal fossa. My gauze is there. I, use, I put the gauze there for protection. Okay. Now you can see I'm going to have to cut a little bit of the masseter muscle here to get to this back region here for my, my approach. Now, I would normally do this if I was going to do my, a normal zygomatic technique, more medial and uh, um, superior to that, okay? But I want to get to this portion of the bone here. In my opinion, this is the hardest part of the zygomatic arch as far as dense part is right back in here. And that's the area I want to get to. So I'm just using my periosteal elevator. I'm going to get rid of the fascia and I'm going to move the muscle back from the area. For the sake of time, I'm going to move a little quicker through this. All right, I'm going to move a little quicker again through this. Get through all this stuff. Okay. So now you're seeing, I'm just getting rid of the rest of these fibers of the muscle. And the muscle reattaches very quickly. There's, I've had no issues with patients with movement of their jaw, soreness in the region. I mean, obviously there's, there's a little bit of, 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 of inflammation in this area and all patients heal differently, but you would think it would be a lot more than it is. Now look at the width here of that bone. Okay, so from the, the, medi the distal portion to the mesial portion of this area here, a buccal palatal portion, however you want to look at that, this bone is thick. This is probably eight millimeters of bone. So we're going to measure it in here, and I'll show you in a second. We'll use a caliper, I believe. We're going to go to the other side first, okay? So here again, we're going up the zygomatic arch, and I'm just using my elevator, and I'm going right back to where I see the insertion of the mass in the muscle and the fascia that's present. Same thing, I'm going to cut a little bit of that, the, the most inferior portion of the attachment of the mass area to the region. All right. And here's, here's we're going to our distal inferior aspect of the zygomatic arch again. So here's my landing spot. This is the ideal landing spot is right here for me in this particular area, okay? All right, let me go through the, the interior stuff. This is pretty routine for everybody. Let's get back to you. Okay. So, so we're gonna back in the area. This is the area we're gonna be dealing with as far as exodus. Now you, you can dissect out more and reflect more if you want, but why? I mean, here's, here's my, well, I'm gonna go back to this, let's go back to this again. Go back to the stop again. Okay, so if we're looking here now, all right, here's the, you could tell, look at the color of the bone, more density, okay? So here's my caliper. This is the width of this area that I'm gonna use for the landing aspect of my implant, okay? So I'll give it a second, let's see what the, what the okay. That's eight and a half millimeters thick. So if the apical end of the implant is 3.75 millimeters or 4.0, I've got enough to have two millimeters of bone, bone around the implant. So this, this to me is, is a no-brainer. Omar. Omar, let's see for a second. I mean, just flattening off the ridge a little bit. Omar, I've seen you many times saying that all on four is dying, and I agree, but there are some cases that you only can place four zygomatic implants. So all on four is zygomatic what it is. Okay, from a, from a technical standpoint, yes, but not from a bone quality standpoint. It may only be four implants in a quad case, but the bone quality where the implants are inserting are much, much better and much more dense than it would be in a posterior maxillary all on four trying to get good bone stability in the first premolar and, and first or second premolar molar region. So that's, that's where I'll disagree with that. And in my opinion, yes, the all on four is dead. Hope all is well, Omar. Okay, let's start. Just flattening off the crest of the ridge, let's go a little bit quicker. We can, just for the sake of time, we're gonna get rid of all that tissue that, that's left. We're just locating the floor of the nose. I'm gonna, all right, so here we go. Go back to this area again, same procedure. You know, this is my technique now. I'm gonna get rid of some of the attachment fibers of the muscle. I'm, I'm taking that eight millimeters of bone for my landing strip. I'm gonna go in with a dental burr, number six around diamond, to get a little knot started for my, my coarse diamond uh, that we're gonna use from Norris. Move a little faster, just to get to that point. Okay, so here now the tip of the diamond burr sits in there. I'm gonna create my notch on the, the, on the crest of the ridge where the implant can seat. Now this is, this is perfect. We're in, the, we're in the first, second molar region. 
Now, doing this in a different way from the zygomatic aspect, if you're going to come at this angle to get in that region, you're going to be going straight for the infraorbital rim. That's the beauty of this. We're staying away from the infraorbital rim, and we're still putting our implant in the first, second molar region. Okay, so here's the, here's the, the second twist drill of noise, and you, you've got your middle, you've got your length telling you right where you're at your drill. I'm going to go with my, my uh, depth gauge, see where I'm at. Here's a, I think this is a 45 millimeter Norris implant, which is going to go into the region. Okay. And you'll see this drill is at 50 Newton centimeters again. So when this baby stops, we're at your ISQ is 50 Newton centimeters. All right. There we go. And we're going to go back in here with a, uh, we'll use our hand wrench now. Here's our hair wrench. So now this is above, this is probably 70, maybe plus Newton centimeters. Here's the maxillary right. We'll see the same thing again. What CT system and FAVE do you use or recommend? Warren, I use the RAS scans. Uh, I, I love them because they give me the 2020 field of view. I believe that the, the manipulation of them, look at this, this is where extra maxillary again. Manipulation is very easy. It gives me exactly what I want. During reduction, coolant use. Yes, saline. All right, here's my drill again. And look at where we're at now. We're going into the second molar region and we're away from all our anatomical structures. And we're in good dense bone. This is my technique. Let me go a little bit quicker here for the tibia. Okay, so here's our implant going again. Now we're 50 Newton centimeters. We're gonna go in here. Here's our torque wrench. Look at, you can tell my hands. I got those big number nine meat hooks, but you know, this, this implant is in good quality bone. Okay, a couple more minutes. Let's get to the end of this. Let me just get to the end so we can get to where we're at. And I'm gonna place my four implants in the anterior. So this is gonna be an all on six MX. Still a great AP spread. Okay, and, and this, in my opinion, is, is, is pretty much like a, 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 a diagrammatic case for a situation like this on what to use. I'm going to go through the drilling again a little quicker. These, these are still going to be off. I think these are four two by 16s in the, in the a, uh, canine region. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm going up to see if I'm engaging in the, the lateral peripheral plate of the nose. Let's get a little quicker through here. And these are 16 or 18 millimeter inputs in the back, 4.2 millimeter diameter Norris tufts. There's my anterior. These are tens, I believe, 4.2 by tens. Okay, hand driver. Let's go again to the end here. Let's get to where we're putting the abutments on. I'm going to wrap it up in five minutes, guys. Is that okay? We're okay? Oh, so should I go faster? No, I can't stay on the Okay, guys, as soon as I get done, then Isaac's going to come out about the CE for this, okay? I'm going to go quick. You guys all know how to do this now, just so we see the last uh, where we're at after the abutments are all placed. And the beauty is, like, like I say, the 45s and 50s. 45s and 50s, uh, 52s are the most common uh, um, abutments I use for the zygomatics. Here's the bone hole suturing where I'm cutting holes through the bone. Uh, uh, on a, a perpendicular area to where the bone is, and my suture will run around there. You always drill through the lateral aspect of the malar process with a twist drill. Uh, yes, but I'm trying to keep it more towards the zygomatic portion uh, anterior to the malar process. You don't have to, but I usually do just so I know where I'm at anatomically because one of the other issues when you're placing zygomatic implants is, you know, where does the apical end of that implant come out in that superior region? And it's very easy to think that you're going to do a 42.5 is what you pick out. But the 42.5 is actually longer and comes out of the bone a little bit quicker. So I, I like to drill through just so I know. But I do that with all my, my preps. I mean, I, I drill beyond as long as I'm not hitting anything anatomically. I will always go deeper than what I'm going to be using for the length of my implant. All right, this is just putting the tissue back together. We can, we can save time for that because I know I have, I have a tendency to be a little long-winded. So here is our, here is, let's get to the end of this. I think there's pictures at the end so we can see it where he's at. Ah, so here's our closure at the end. So you see where we're at. So good creatinized tissue around all of the, the implants, the zygomatic implants. So, you know, great AP spread. This is, this to me is, is, is where it's at. Okay. And here's this case, complete CT scans. So let's do this. I was going to tease you a little bit with, with Jeannie's case, but I think I'm going to stop that. I'm going to exit. Oh, uh, that's not good. How do I go back into play? Let's go play here. All right, so what I wanted to do is get to this end. Let's just run through Jeannie's right away for two seconds. Here's how she comes to me, upper pancake type denture in place. And you could see sufficiency with the denture out. And this denture is, is, is more or less like a hockey puck. It's moving all over. So here's her case here. I mean, and you can see from the flat, all fibrous tissue in the crest of the ridge. Anybody that does these types of flaps, there's no pregnancy issue. No, these are just very, very difficult cases to manage. 
and we'll go over this. I have a video of this too. We'll go over this in the next one that we're going to do. Here's our pre-planning with our base uh, uh, program from the Roscan. Here's a month later. She's got her final dentition, her nano ceramics, and she's uh, she's down in Florida enjoying herself. Here's a pre-treatment. Here's her case complete. And this is just definitive treatment for people. There's a smile. And uh, these are your programs that we have available. You can let us know anywhere. But here's our mentorship offerings that we have. So anybody that's interested, you can contact me at any time, or you can contact Nadim, N-A-D-E-M, at implantlive.com. And uh, that's his email. And uh, he'd be happy to talk to you about any of the things we have, or all the people at Norris know how to get a hold of me. If anybody's interested in spending some time mentoring in here. Our courses we have in South America. They're in Manizales, Colombia. We have one in October. Uh, we take eight people only, and it's over four days. Uh, we, I think we have one or two spots for October, and we're probably going to add another one back, although with everything going on with COVID, uh, we'll have to see what happens in August. And the same thing, as I said, I hope everybody's being safe and being prudent with what they're doing with their lives. I know that we're locked up in our apartment, and my wife and I and the baby are having a wonderful time, okay? So anybody that wants to uh, contact us, you can please do it. Uh, here's our implant live, and then Start Smiling is my the dental implant center is, 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 is myself. So you, please feel free to call us with anything you might have. It's been a pleasure to spend some time with everybody, and uh, I hope uh, I kept it a little lively for you. This is usually how I like to do things when I'm teaching, and uh, it, I'll be looking forward to the one we're going to do in May. We're going to get a little more aggressive in May with some of the stuff we're doing. And Sharif says, thanks a lot for a wonderful lecture. Sharif, you got it, brother. My, my pleasure to help you. What? Oh, if anybody has any questions before I switch over to Isaac for your CE, send them in quickly. We'll wrap it up. Warren, thank you, Warren. Nice to have you. Um, so I'll give it another half a second or so before we Paulie the man. There's Jackson. Thank you very much. Okay, give another one here. Oh, here's more. Awesome lecture. Thank you, Michael. Awesome lecture. Thanks for us. Thank you. Someday I'll go to Chicago to see your practice. You're amazing, Dr. Winner. Okay, you got it, Omar. We're here for you, waiting for you. We're waiting for you. Okay, everybody, thanks so much. I'm gonna give it back to Isaac. I don't have to do anything. I'll do it. Okay, we're gonna do it. Thanks, everybody. Hang tight for Isaac. Please take a moment to take a picture of the screen. Now, this is the information on how to receive your CE credits. We also have a QR code over here on the bottom left-hand corner. Um, we will also be sending out an email to anyone that does not receive this information. And again, thank you very much.